Now that we've actually mathematically solved the infinite potential well, uh, it is very useful for us to continue on and start analyzing what these solutions actually mean. So to start doing that, what I've done is we've written out the solution for the spatial component of the separable solution, and we also have the corresponding energies, and we also have the first three solutions. And what I mean by this is that, well, these functions are determined based on this index. Uh, we, have, we have this indexing term n, both in our psi functions and also in our energy terms. So earlier on in 2.1, one of the things that we sort of stated without proof was that the solutions for the time independent wave consisted of not just a single solution, but rather this infinite set. And we're seeing this as proof in the sort of in, in this specific example of the infinite square well. And as we will see later on when we move to different sort of scenarios, uh, this is just generally true. We will always result in sort of these sort of indexes that give us an infinite set of solutions for any sort of uh, separable solution that we're dealing with in any sort of quantum system. So uh, apparently what this tells us, uh, as we've said before, is that solutions uh, to the time independent wave function are not individual, but rather consist of this sort of infinite set. And to sort of convey what this means or to get an idea of like what this is like, uh, we've sort of graphed out the first three solutions for n equals one, two, and three respectively, because remember that n is just a positive integer. So one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, all the way up to infinity. And by looking at this, we can sort of have, there's a few things that we can sort of uh, conclude. So first off, uh, as you can see already, this first point is that the functions for psi are alternatively even and odd with respect to the center of the well. And hopefully this is a very obvious thing that you can just instantly sort of see uh, because, well, if we look at psi one uh, and our center of the well is at a half, obviously there's symmetry about this middle point. So as a result of that, uh, this is even. This second function about our middle point is sort of a reflection. So because of that, it's odd. Our third function about our middle point is once again symmetrical, so it's even again, and this pattern goes on. Uh, the second part, or the second sort of point that we can make, which is hopefully also something that you can sort of infer instantly, is that as we go up in index number, each successive solution has an additional node. And this is effectively identical to sort of a standing string. And since everyone is supposed to be coming from sort of classical mechanics, we've already analyzed sort of simple harmonic motion, harmonics, higher harmonics, subharmonics for wave motions uh, and whatnot for standing waves. This is effectively identical to sort of a standing wave situation. And uh, this isn't necessarily a useful observation right now, but it will become very useful later on when we sort of start dealing with more complicated solutions. For now, it sort of is just sufficient for us to sort of uh, recognize the fact that these sort of wave function solutions for our infinite potential well are, for all intents and purposes, uh, identical to the solutions for a standing wave where we are applying higher modes of harmonics and vibrations onto the system. The third claim, which is a significantly bolder one, is that the individual solutions in a given set are what is known as mutually orthogonal. And what we mean by this is that if we take an integral of all, over all of space, so from negative infinity to positive infinity, or from zero to a in this case, because our size only are defined from zero to a, uh, if we do the sum of one solution with another solution with different indices, so n and m, where n and m both equal some positive integer but not each other, uh, this integral apparently resolves to zero. And this is a very sort of powerful uh, property that a lot of functions follow, in fact, that all uh, sort of separable solutions follow, and it's very useful uh, for later on when we start developing more complicated equations and formulas and start looking at systems that are more complicated than just sort of this simple infinite square well. But 
before we even get to any of those and before we even start actually using this uh, the first thing we should do is probably to prove this so that's exactly what we're going to do uh, if we write this out fully then what we're going to get is that this integral is going to be equal to and we have square root of 2 over a as a constant at the front so that just gets squared into just 2 over a and then we have our integral over all of space, which is in this case, just from zero to a, because our wave function isn't defined outside of our well. And then we have two of these expressions, one in terms of n and one in terms of m. So sine of m pi over a times sine of n pi over a dx. And our goal is sort of to show that this apparently does in fact evaluate to zero. So uh, one of the first things that we can sort of do is we can use uh, a trig function. So let's sort of do that. I'm just going to take a snip of this, copy it, paste it here. So we can use a trig function here to sort of uh, take advantage and simplify this expression a little bit. So sine a times sine of b is one equal to one half cosine a minus b minus cosine of a plus b. This is just a generic trig identity for converting from products into sums and differences. So if we express in terms of this, uh, what we'll get is that this is going to be equal to one over a times the integral from zero to a times cosine, well, maybe I don't need the parentheses, times cosine of m minus n over a times pi x subtracted by cosine of, and this time, m plus n divided by a times pi x dx. And here, uh, sort of the two up here gets canceled with the two under here. So we only have one over a and then everything else just goes as normal. Uh, at this point, we can just sort of plug this into an integral calculator and solve it. Uh, so what this will give us is the following expression. Uh, we're going to get one over pi times sine of m minus n times pi. And actually, it might be a little bit neater if we go one step further in the bracket notation here and use a curly bracket instead of a square one. And then this whole thing is going to be divided by m minus n. minus, and then we're going to do sine once again, this time of m plus n multiplied by pi, divided by m plus n, And this is what our expression equals. And from this point, uh, we should instantly sort of be able to conclude that this equals zero. Uh, and the reason why is because m is a positive constant. Like we, we know that m is a positive integer and n is a positive integer and they don't equal each other. So that must mean that uh, m minus n times pi and also m plus n times pi equals some new constant, let's call it j times pi, where j is once again some positive constant. And we know that sine of uh, any positive constant j times pi, where this must equal zero if j is equal to any positive. So one, two, three, not just positives, but also negatives as well. And uh, since we already know this, uh, 
and the fact that m minus n must equal sort of one of these positive constants or one of the negative constants depending on if m is greater than or less than n uh, in this case uh, this expression necessarily resolves to zero now uh, once again we've sort of uh, we've sort of defined this property we don't actually know how it's uh, apparently meant to be used. We don't know if it's useful or not. I'm going to claim right now that this is a very powerful property that we can sort of use later on and that will help us solve a lot of different systems that we encounter sort of later in the book. But for now, uh, we're just going to introduce this as a rule uh, and hopefully you can see from this proof that this is in fact true. And as it turns out, this is true for all separable solutions. Uh, and uh, it will inevitably turn out to be very useful as we sort of start moving on to more complicated systems. Um, now, as for this integral, uh, this is a relatively simple integral to do, although it looks very messy. Uh, I just plugged it into an integral calculator, uh, but if you really want to go into the nitty gritty, by all means, you can do this on your own. Uh, this isn't a particularly difficult one. It's just an integral of two cosine terms. So other than just like sort of the more messy pulling of terms of these m minus n over a times pi and m plus n over a times pi, uh, it's relatively simple to do. Now, uh, finally, uh, we've sort of introduced this, what's called mutually orthogonal property. Uh, the other property that sort of links to this is sort of uh, normality, because we also know, uh, so let's actually pull this down right now. Control C, and let's, let's pull this down here. Uh, we have this property. Uh, the other property we have is that the sort of integral over all of space of the magnitude of some given psi n squared dx must equal 1. So in, evidently what this means is that if m does equal 1 then this integral just resolves to 1. So this is uh, sort of this is mutual orthogonality or this property is referred to as mutual orthogonality and this property is referred to as normalization. And we can actually combine these two terms because they're very similar to one another. The only thing that's different is that sort of this conjugate term has a different index. Uh, and we can combine these two to form this new property that's called orthonormality. And what orthonormality says is that uh, the integral of psi m star times psi n dx equals this expression that's called a Dirac delta. And we draw it like this. And we're going to call it Dirac delta sub mn. And what this is, and effectively what this is, is that this, this Dirac delta, or sorry, not Dirac delta, Kronecker delta uh, is the name of this sort of variable. And what, what this represents is that this expression, uh, Kronecker delta sub mn, uh, is equal to either 0 or 1. And it equals 0 when m does not equal n. And it equals 1 when m does equal n. And we're not really introducing anything new by doing this. It's just sort of a way to compact our notation. And while right now it seems sort of arduous and sort of seems like we're just pulling this to make the expression seem more fancy, uh, later on when we start dealing with more complicated expressions that are significantly longer than what uh, we're currently working with, uh, this will come in very handy in sort of like simplifying and making our expressions more compact so that we can actually write them down in the span of one page instead of like five, for example. This final point that we're going to make is something that we actually referenced back in 2.1, which is called completeness. And what we mean by that is that any arbitrary function f of x can be sort of expressed as a linear combination of stationary state x-dependent solutions. So uh, we sort of stated this in 2.1 without any proof, and here we're writing it out with the form of the spatial solutions for the infinite square well. Note that this is true for any sort of separable system, and as a result of that, the psi n terms will actually defer depending on what specific system you're dealing with. However, this is just something that's generally true. Uh, and once again, we stated this in 2.1 without proof. We theoretically could prove this with sort of the mathematical tools we have right now, but it would, for all intents and purposes, would be way too complicated and would sort of start verging into the territory of a math major instead. So 
what we're going to do is we're going to simply recognize that this equation is sort of the exact same form as the Fourier series. And uh, in sort of calculus, we've already learned that any function can always be expanded as a Fourier series, specifically in this case for a infinite potential well. Uh, this is obviously a Fourier series. Um, if we had some other sort of system that wasn't a potential well, it wouldn't be as obvious. But from just from this alone, we can have a reasonable sort of confidence that at least for the infinite square well, uh, its set of, of space dependent solutions are in fact complete. Uh, as it will turn out, uh, all of the other sort of systems, which are more complicated than a infinite square wall that we haven't dealt with yet will also be complete, uh, but those uh, will only get harder to sort of prove completeness for. So uh, oftentimes what happens in physics is that we will sort of just assume that a given set of solutions is complete and hope that it is, because if it isn't, then everything becomes a lot harder, and generally we don't have to worry about those cases, at least not in sort of uh, a complete introduction to quantum mechanics like something like this. Uh, so because of that, let's just sort of state this and uh, sort of live on with it for now. Uh, however, the reason why we're bringing this back, or the reason why we're sort of emphasizing this again is because last time we sort of just stated this, uh, and we didn't actually give any method for actually solving a system and finding the individual coefficient cn. So here, uh, what we're going to do, now that we've sort of introduced orthonormality, uh, we actually have the tools to find what any individual coefficient is in our linear combination for any arbitrary function f of x. Uh, and the way we're going to do this is a method known as Fourier's trick. Uh, and it is a very cheatsy sort of mathematical trick that we're going to pull off. And it does sort of feel like we're cheating a little bit. But as we sort of go deeper into more complicated math and physics, these sort of tricks or manipulation of the mathematical formulae will become more and more common, so it's very important to sort of get used to them as we go, especially starting from now. So to actually find these coefficients c sub n, uh, we're going to start with this expression, f of x equals the summation from n equals 1 to infinity of c n psi n of x. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by psi m star. So we're going to introduce, uh, just like before, a new index m, which is not the same as n, and we're going to say psi m star times f of x is equal to the summation from n equals 1 to infinity of c n psi n and then psi m star. So far, a relatively simple expression. All we've done is we multiply both sides by psi m star. Uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to take the integral of both sides over all of space. So if we do the integral of psi m star times f of x dx, then this is going to be equal to, and we're going to take the integral on this side as well, However, uh, we can take a few things out of our integral, namely things that don't have x dependency. So first off, we're going to take the summation out of the integral. So the summation from n equals 1 to infinity. We can also take out the cn integral, or the cn terms, the coefficients. Uh, and then we're going to take the integral over all of space of psi, and we're just going to reorganize here a little bit, psi m star times psi n dx. And uh, hopefully, you see from here, we literally just proved orthonormality earlier. So from this point, this is literally just equal to the summation um, from n equals 1 to infinity of cn times our chronic or delta of n and m. And from this point, uh, what we have here is, well, we learned that the Kronecker delta is equal to either 1 or 0. And the only case where it does equal 1 and not 0 is when n equals m. So actually, what this equals is just cm. Because any other expression for n will result in just the Kronecker delta equaling 0. And just like that, we've sort of solved this, uh, we, we've sort of solved this expression for the coefficients. Because we now know that the integral of psi m star 
times f of x dx is equal to cm. Or if we want to go back to the n index, we can say that any arbitrary coefficient in this sort of expansion, uh, let's index by n, is equal to the integral of uh, the nth stationary states conjugate multiplied by our arbitrary function f of x dx. And we can just define f of x as anything, really. So um, now, as a result of that, we can now expand any function as sort of an infinite sum or infinite series of uh, solutions in terms of our infinite square well solutions. And as we will see later on, we can do the same thing for any other system that's also separable. And from this point, uh, we can just expand any arbitrary function and sort of find our coefficients. So this is, once again, just like point number three, uh, sort of a very powerful uh, sort of rule that we've devised. Although point number three, uh, the use of three will come in much later, but four, hopefully, is very obviously useful to you because we now just have a way of defining all of these coefficients. Let's, as a final sort of thing, review sort of the four points that we've come up with here. Uh, and as we see, uh, or as we will see for later on, uh, these four conditions hold not just for the infinite square well, but also for a large variety of other potentials, as long as we're dealing with sort of separable solutions. Uh, let's go over each of them again. So first off, um, alternating even and odd sort of wave functions as we go up sort of the integer list from n equals one to two to three to four to five, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is true as long as our potential is symmetrical. and by that, what we, what, what we mean is that our infinite well had sort of this sort of appearance to it, where it was sort of, uh, or actually not, it does not look like this, apologies. Uh, starting from zero and then going to A, where our potential looked sort of like this. Oops. This is V and this is X. And this obviously has symmetry about a equal about x equals one half, uh, and as we see, uh, or as we will see, sort of any sort of potential that has symmetry like this, whether it be about the origin or about some x equals value, as long as it displays some kind of symmetry, this idea of sort of alternating between even and odd functions as we go up in index number will be true. Uh, point two: the fact that higher ends result in additional nodes additional nodes in our wave function this is just always true regardless of what sort of potential we're dealing with uh mutual orthogonality is mostly true we will sort of prove this and like uh we will we'll prove cases where this isn't true later on in chapter three but this is generally true and we can assume that it's true uh for completeness the fact which we just went over the fact that we can express any function as a linear combination of all of these uh, stationary sort of uh, time independent solutions. This is also mostly true, but proving this is more often than not way more difficult than it's worth doing. So in most cases, we just sort of assume that a function has completeness and just hope for the best. Because if it doesn't, then it is uh, making its way to becoming sort of this very difficult and painful problem to solve. And we generally won't have to worry about this in this level of quantum mechanics. To finally sort of put a wrap on everything we've done so far, let's go over this basic sort of review. So in 2.1, we defined stationary states. So we defined psi of x comma t as the product of a time independent solution, little psi of x, and a time dependent one, phi of t. And we solved for phi of t and found that it equals this exponential term e to the negative i e t over h bar. Next, we went down and sort of defined our infinite square well potential. And for that square well, we found the specific set of solutions, psi sub n of x, which equals this expression over here. And we also found the possible values for the energy, uh, e sub n. So if we plug both of these back up into this, so we plug in psi sub n of x, or psi, just psi sub n of x for psi of x, and we plug in e sub n for e, uh, then what we get is this expression. and Moving on from that, uh, if we take into account completeness theorem, which we defined earlier, uh, we can say that any arbitrary solution, not just the solution for the infinite score well, but any arbitrary wave function for any system can be defined, in fact, as a linear combination of sort of these uh, psi sub n states. And 
let's do a little bit of an exercise now because earlier on we sort of figured out how to solve for these coefficients c sub n because we know that c sub n is evidently equal to the integral of psi n star times our arbitrary function f of x dx so uh, let's try to find this now <clears throat> normally uh, if we did this, evidently, there's this very painful sort of exponential function on the side that we sort of want to get rid of. So one way that we can sort of take advantage of this math and cheat a little bit, uh, I should say, is we can define a new function, given this arbitrary wave function that can be some correct wave function for any system, we can define a new arbitrary wave function and just call it psi of x comma zero. So this is my initial wave function at time equals zero. And at t equals zero, well, I just have exponential to the power of zero, which is just one. So this just equals sort of uh, the summation from n equals one to infinity. And remember, the coefficients are only dependent on n. They're not dependent on any other value. So at time equals zero, my coefficients are actually still sort of the exact same. And then multiplied by psi sub n of x. And from here, uh, because of the fact that the CNs I've defined here are the exact same as the CNs I've defined here, uh, or as the CNs I've defined up here, sort of these two CNs are the exact same, uh, because of that, I can just use this instead of this complicated expression with like this really crappy exponential that I don't want to deal with. I can just use this, which is a lot neater. So if I do that, well, now I know CN is going to be equal to the integral. and psi n star is just going to be square root of 2 over a times sine of n pi over a times x, and then multiplied by the arbitrary function that we've defined so far, which is just psi of x comma 0. And close it off with the dx, and obviously our uh, well is only defined from zero to a, and we can just solve it exactly like this. If we know what our wave function is originally, then we can just we we can just find the coefficients like that. Uh, granted, at this point uh, in this arbitrary example, we don't actually know what the initial wave function is, so this is sort of as far as we can go. But uh, in actual in a lot of like sort of practice problems that we'll be doing, uh, we will be given the exact form for psi of x comma zero, and we can just plug it into here and we can find all the coefficients uh, and sort of go back to this original expression uh, and just solve it like that.